I will be reading Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. And it says, You may say to yourselves, These nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well that the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. You saw with your own eyes the great trials, the miraculous signs and wonders, the mighty hand of God and outstretched arm, with which the Lord your God brought out to you. The Lord your God will do the same to all the peoples you now fear. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until even the survivors who hide from you have perished. Do not be terrified by them, for the Lord your God who is among you is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive out both nations before you, little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or wild animals will multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, throwing them into the great confusion until they are destroyed. He will give their kings into your hand, and you will wipe out their names from under heaven. No one will be able to stand up against you. You will destroy them. Thank you, Josiah. It's good to be back with you all. Been on vacation for a couple of weeks. I have to remember how to work things. So. Uh, we had a great time. And uh, thanks to Joel and to Joshua for preaching for me while I was gone. And so I appreciate that. I understand they did a good job. And uh, from what one said, my job's in jeopardy now. So, <laughs> uh, But it's good to be back. It's good to see all of you here. I understand it's Joshua's birthday. So if you can give him the birthday spanking, please do. I'm not sure if he's here or not, but, you know, it, it may take several of you to do that, actually. So, uh, anyway, happy birthday. Life Tree Cafe is going to continue this week. I'm excited about that. Thank you, Calvin, for doing it last week. And uh, the new classes are started, and so lots of good things are happening here. I'm really excited about that. I want us to be able to talk about God being with us. And what that really means. Because a lot of people say, oh, God is with you or God is with me. But you never quite understand what that really means. Um, a lot of times we, we just assume that God is going to take care of things. And sometimes the question is, why do we really need God with us? Well, the reason that we might need God with us is pretty obvious right now when you look at hurricanes that have come through Texas with Harvey and Irma, who is now, uh, this is Irma, right at the place where it is knocking out all kinds of power in Miami, where I used to be. We had uh, notes from friends. There's over a million people there who are now without power. If you look at the hurricane track, it is going right over my son's house by tonight. Uh, he is not there, thankfully. He is evacuated, just like so many other people. I think there was over 6 million people they were trying to evacuate out of the area. I'm sure not all of those went, but uh, they're kind of stubborn down there. They think, nah, we can do it. And so, but it is going to be going up the west coast of Florida. And so we, we think at times like this, well, yes, I want God with me because... There's a disaster about to happen. There's something horrible that's about to go on. And so I want God to be with me so that he can keep me safe, so that I don't have all of those things that, that would come. And, and, you know, he's going to take it all away, and things are, are not going to be the same. And so I want us to be able to look at what that really means. I know we have great ties there. I know Joel grew up in Marathon, and... Uh, it's just, it's already passed over marathon. I'm sure you have people that you know that uh, have been hit by this already. But I want us to look at scripture and, and look at what it means for God to say that, that he is with us. And the passage that Josiah has read for us today 
is a time where in Deuteronomy they're about to go into the promised land, but God is giving them a kind of a restatement of here's what needs to happen and here's where you need to be. And so Moses is trying to encourage the people about here's what is going on and here's how things need to happen. And so he comes to this part and he he says, now, if you say in your heart, well, how can we do this? Well, why would they say that? Well, because the last time he, they were here, they sent spies into the land and they saw giants and they decided, well, this is too big for us. We obviously can't take this land. We're afraid. Let's go back into slavery. And, and so he says, I, I understand that you might be still afraid. It's been 40 years. They shouldn't be afraid, but maybe that's why it takes such a long time. And when they get there, there's always that you know, are we really going to be able to do this? And so I think that's what's happening with them at this point. We would want God with us anytime we take on a big project like that. And certainly that's what Moses is giving them here. Don't you remember the times when God was with you? Don't you remember how God brought you out of Egypt? And you thought you'd never get out of Egypt. And that's why you cried to God at that time and thought, We'll never get out of here. We're in slavery. How can we ever do anything? And, and truly, they couldn't. There is no way for them to deliver themselves. But God went in, and God sent plagues. And they remember the frogs and the flies and the lice and all of those other plagues that took place where now they're able to come out. Now they're able to be delivered because God allowed it, and God made it all possible. And he says, so I want you to remember those things and remember all of that. And then I want you to remember what's going to happen here. And I think this is so amazing as you look at this whole thing. God says, you know what? I'm going to send hornets. And I'm like, hornets? Why hornets? I mean, that's the battle plan. Don't we have mighty angels marching in ahead of us or, you know, cannons or something? He says, no, I'm going to send hornets. Well, because who hasn't jumped when a hornet gets after them? I mean, everybody's going to jump, right? I don't know of anybody who just sits there and says, go ahead, sting me. <laughs> you know, we all jump a little bit or run away or try to, he says, I'm going to send hornets before. And apparently hornets so much that it's going to drive the people out. They're going to say, I don't want to stay in a place that has hornets all the time. But certainly God's going to take care of that part too. And so he's trying to say that all of this is going to happen. The Lord God will be with you. You don't need to be a, afraid of all these people who are left. And then as you look at the last section of this whole thing, he says, the Lord God in your midst is a great and awesome God. And I think that's one of the best things they have to remember is about God and about who he is, that he is a great and awesome God. And so he's going to do all of these good things for them. And what a cr tremendous thing it's going to be. Joshua's going to go in and take over the land. And they don't know any of these plans yet. But he says, how about if we march around this city and the walls are to fall down? How about that? Well, nobody has battle plans like that. But God says, you know, if you just trust me and you go ahead and go and you go ahead and do what you know to do, then things are going to work out. And you may not know exactly how it's all going to happen. But time after time after time, we read in the Bible about how it, it, it just worked out and how they won great victories and how they defeated enemies and how they came to places where they needed to be. And then we look at our life and say, that'll never happen to me. Really? The difference between us and them is zero. God was with them. God is with us. And that's the main point I want you to realize today is you can look back and read a whole book full of things that happen. Some huge and mighty miracles, some very small. Because God says, I'm not going to drive them all out in one mighty rush. I'm going to do it little by little. Well, we're not used to that. We don't want that. I mean, we wanted, let's have the, the great mighty thing. We need burning bushes. We need seas parted. We need walk across on dry land. We need, you know, all of these great miracles. He says, no, I'm going to do it little by little. 
And I think that's the way God works more in my life. Doesn't he work that way more in your life? As you look back on your life, can you see places where God has blessed? And it's not so much that he, he, he destroyed it all at once. It's, you know, I did it little by little for a reason. Because if you just wipe out all the people, then you're going to have to kill all the animals. And they're going to come in. And then you're going to be fighting lions and tigers and bears. And we know how that goes. He says there's all of these things that you have to be able to realize that God is doing it in the best way. And so the whole point of this is to point your life in the right direction. Because the right direction means God is going to be with you. And that just means things are going to work better. When God is with you, then all of that takes place. He sees the plan. He sees how things are. We set our life in His direction. And we're able to see how things work. And what an amazing thing it is for us. Another passage that... I think is important is from Psalm 23. And this is a passage of David who had had so many things that uh, went right and so many things that went wrong in his life. But he writes this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why is this such a popular song? I mean, out of all the psalms you could pick, why this one? Because this one talks about God being with us. This one talks about all the blessings of God. This one talks about how God has provided. This one talks about peace and comfort. And and that's what we want. But you realize who it is that writes it. It's a guy who has completely put his life in God's hands. And that everything in his life is because God gave it to him. It's because he, he set the direction of his life to be following God. And everything was that way. He was an anointed king and yet refused to assassinate the other king because he would wait for God to give it to him. Why? I mean, that's the normal way of taking over a government, right? No, he says, I'll wait for God to give it to me. And God does. And God gives him so many other things. And so David looks at it this way. This is a psalm about David's friendship with God. That's really what it's about. It's a shepherd who cares for him. He takes care of his needs. He's there when he needs something. He restores his soul. It's about pasture and water. And he guides him into paths of righteousness. And then he talks about this valley of the shadow of death. When you get to the valley of the shadow of death, what happens? Most of the time, we panic. Most of the time, we look at things like that and go, you know what, I'm not really sure I'm ready for this. If the wind was blowing 130 miles an hour in Arizona, yeah, that's one great haboob. That would, <laughs> there would be so much dust in the air, we'd, we'd probably all choke. But David says, I can do that because I will fear no evil because you are with me. And that's what solves the fear. If we could just get the fact that God is with us, then it kind of helps us deal with the fear that we have because God is always going to provide for that. And I know a lot of people who are in that situation right now. And I could be very much afraid for them. I am very much praying for them. But I also know that God is with them. David had constant enemies between Saul and the Philistines and even his own family. But he finds a place of comfort when he's close to God. He says, I'm going to live in your house. Goodness and mercy are always going to follow me. I'll, I'll live in your house forever. And what a great thing it is to realize that. 
Sometimes we see the dark or we see the thunderstorm or the lightning and we get afraid. Maybe you know of children who are like that or you have a pet that's like that. We've learned not to be afraid so much. We've also learned to not walk outside when it's going on either because you just don't want to be there. But what does it mean for God to be with us? Well, I think there's at least two things. Uh, the first one is, is we think he'll fix it, that he'll take it away, that he'll make it all better, and that somehow he will not let it happen, and that he will fix it. And there are times when I feel like we've prayed and hurricanes have not gone where they're supposed to go. And so maybe Miami, that's the reason why they're not hit. And maybe why it's going to go a different direction. And then the second reason, I think, is maybe even more important. Is that there's someone there with you when you go through it. It's not that you don't have to go through it, and it's not that he's going to fix it, and it's not that it's going to be taken away. It's just that somebody is there with you, and you're not going to be alone. I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, but most of the time we feel better when somebody else is there to do it with us, and it doesn't really matter what it is. You see, Jesus, when he comes to the garden, says, why have you forsaken me? Not in the garden, but on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? His prayer in the garden. Don't let this happen. He knows it's going to happen, but God does not take it away. But Jesus knows the plan. And he knows God will be there on the other side. And he knows that don't be far away from me, as he calls out in Psalm 22. I will go through it. But I will come out on the other side, and God will raise me up, and I will be a new king. And we, if we could just get to where we could see that other side, and I think that comes when we realize that you know, God is with us. So let me give you a couple of other passages. These are New Testament ones. It's from the very first time when we see Jesus. It talks about, in Matthew 1, verse 20, it says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. It's the time of Jesus' birth. It says, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sin. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel had commanded him. What an amazing time to realize God with us, that God is here, that God has been born, and that that's his name even, that God is with us. And that, that was always one of the things that they, they took great pride in and, and great meaning from was what is the name of this person? What does it mean? Because it said something about them. And certainly with Jesus, his name is Emmanuel also, and it's God with us. So what a great time to be able... There were no huge banners. Baby born here. Jesus has arrived. It's little by little. Because as you watch Jesus being born, and as you watch him grow up, and as you watch him then begin to interact and begin to preach, sure, the crowd goes, grows larger and larger but he inter interacts with all of the individuals. And we have some of those stories. We have names of people. Here's what Jesus did for this person and this person and this person. But we don't have all of them. And the point is that Jesus was a very personal, and he does it slowly, and he does it one person at a time. And, and sometimes that's the way it is for God with us. Is it, is it, it isn't that, you know, okay, he solved the whole church. It's that you know what? He is with each one of us, and, and he'll be with you more than he is with you, but you're going to get it next, and then you, and then you. And he does all of these things. And, and so don't look at it and say, well, everybody else gets God but me, and he's with all of them but not me. Your time's coming. It's little by little, and God's going to be there. What an amazing thing he does. As Jesus is passing from this life, he gives the Lord's Supper, and it's interesting the way that he does this in Matthew 26. 
Start with me in verse 26. It says, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take ye, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say with you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He says, I'm going to be there and I'm going to drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, he didn't mean he was coming back in the same way. It meant he was coming back and he was going to be with them and he's going to be with everyone who takes of this communion. He was with us today. He says, I come to that time to be with you. And it's the renewing of the covenant. It's the making of a promise that, that we would do with God and that he would do with us. And so it's not a deliverance from anything else. It's just that you get to say to God again, I'm still yours. And I still want you to lead and guide my life. And, and he has a chance to say back to us, I've got you. Don't worry about anything else. Because all of my promises are true, and I will be with you forever, and I will take care of you. And that's what communion is about. It's a remembering of this great sacrifice. It's a remembering of all of the history of what God has done. It's a remembrance of God being with us. And that's really what it's all about. I'll drink it new with you. He wouldn't say that unless he was going to actually do that. And so he was with us this morning. He's still with us this morning. And his promise is always true among us. We see at the very end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, when Jesus last speaks to them, he came up and he spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Interesting, the last part. I will be with you always. That's kind of hard to misunderstand, isn't it? Now, he gives you some things that are happening here, and I want us to realize that that's what's going on. I mean, Jesus is called God with us. It's what his name means. But he comes to make disciples and call people to him. And so that's one of those things that's extremely important. When he brings about the Lord's Supper and he gives it to his disciples and to us as well, it's for people who have been following him and who have become disciples. And he says, then you know I will be with you. I will be here to make that covenant with you. I drink it with you. He doesn't come to drink it with the whole world because they didn't show up. They're not here. They're off doing whatever they want to do. And if you're not here, you're not taking it with him. Because it is in the assembly. And that's what he talks about with this. And so he says, I'll be here with you to drink it. And it's not the same if you just do it somewhere else. It's when you're gathered. He has that promise to be with us. He has that promise to be in, among us. And as we look at what he talks about here in this passage in Matthew 28. He sends them out as disciples. He says, I want you to go and make disciples. And then he says, I will be with you in this. It isn't just work that I gave you to do and well, try and get some. He says, no, when you go, I go. And when you talk to people, I'm talking to people and I'm going to be with you in this. And I will be part of the conversation with you. And I will help you with this because it's my work as well. It's not just a matter of saying, well, all right, you guys try and do it the best you can. And let me just give you a command and a task and, and let's see who does better. It's no, I'm always going to be there. I don't know if that helps or not. Does that make a difference when we think about talking to people about Jesus and trying to help them be disciples as well? I think it would help me a lot because it's really about walking in somebody else's shoes. And he's got a lot bigger shoes than I got. And so I'm kind of glad that he's the one who goes with me. I never think that I'm the one who's doing it all. When I do sermons, it's not because 
I'm so smart and I've got it all together. I really trust God to be with me and able to do this and able to make the message that, that comes across to be his message, not just what I'm able to think of. And so it's about God being with us and making us and allowing us and guiding us and helping us. And it's amazing how it all works. One last passage in Philippians 4. He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. And so he says, think about good things. Do we see any good things in our world today? If you look at the news, it's not going to be good things because they don't report good things. So you're not going to see good things there. Where do you go to find good things? Well, hopefully you can come here and you're going to hear some good things. Do your friends always talk about good things? Do you have friends who are encouraging and always positive and always uplifting? Or do you have friends who talk about the weather and how hot it is and hurricanes that are going on and how this is bad and that's bad and we've got to worry about. He says it's so easy to get caught up in that. It's so easy to let that take over your life and we've got concerns about this and, and worries about this and we've got to solve this over here and there are so many things that, that seem to just crowd in on top of us. He says, for God to give you peace, you cannot let your mind go that way. Do you get that? He's trying to say, if you want the peace of God and God to be with you, then change the way you think to whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and stay away from the news. I mean, it's okay for you to watch it. Just don't focus on that. It's good to know what's going on in the world, but that is not your world. Your world is about what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely. Do those. He says that's really our focus. If there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, I want, that's, you dwell on those things. That's your real focus and where your life really needs to be. So don't miss that part. Don't, you know, God says, I'll be with you, but be my disciple and I'm with you. He says, I'll be with you, but focus on where you need to focus and I'll be with you. And so many times we miss the other part. We think, oh, God, just come be with me. I'm a mess. He says, I've told you how to fix that. It's not that it's unconditional. And I'm there, but you know you're not helping yourself. And you're not making it easy on yourself. And so I want you to be there to take of my communion and to remember all the things I've done for you and all the things I did for people back then. And remember that cross and remember those times when Jesus is there. He says, I want you to remember that. I want you to know about that. I want you to focus your mind on those things. I want you to realize that when you do good works for me, and you do, right? When you do good works, a lot of the times it works out so good because God is with us. I've always found it so interesting as you look at the parable of the talents. He did not give the, the nine-talent guy who did nothing and uh, completely failed and uh, you know, invested it all and lost it all. Why doesn't he have that guy? The guy who had, you know, more than everybody else. And he spent it, he invested it all, and then, oh, the market was just terrible and he lost it all. You know why? That doesn't happen. I mean, not that you won't lose money, but you won't lose blessing. And somehow, when God gives you what he gives you, there will be the blessing from it. And every time I've experienced loss, I've also experienced blessing from it. And so don't ever think that there's a time when you don't invest for God that blessing does not come. It always does.
because God is with you. But we have to get our life in the right track. We have to get our life in the right place. And I think that's what has to happen a lot of times, is for us to be able to do that. When God keeps us safe from disaster, I think that's important. When you are blessed by God in your relationship and in your covenant, when we do his work, when he gives us peace in our life, what an incredible thing that is that God is with us. So what do you do when Jesus is with you? Is there anything you need to change about the way you think or about the way you live or about the way you speak? Maybe we need some help in doing that. If we can help, let us know. Please come while we stand and sing.